run away from a church that is shaped by the culture of this world. The Spirit of the World Many people are being deceived. Many churches have accepted the spirit of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, so that we may know and understand the wonderful things freely given to us by God. There is, therefore, a spirit of the world. What does this spirit command? 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's resources, or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. We read, Do not love the world. That is, we are not to love either the world's system or its way of doing things. Human society often follows a secular approach that disregards or denies the existence of God. It can be tempting to conform to this way of thinking and living. Notice what the world wants from us, love. This love is manifested in the form of sacrifices of time, attention, and money. We are encouraged and persuaded to give our time, attention, and money to the things of this world instead of the things of God. If you love the world, there are rewards to be gained. You might discover a place that bestows distinction, position, honor, and comfort upon you. The global order understands how to lavish affection on those it cherishes. On the other hand, even at their peak, the benefits we reap from this world only stick with us for as long as we live. The problem is that though we gain prestige, status, honor, and comfort of this world, we lose the prestige, status, honor, and comfort of heaven. We read, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. To put it more succinctly, Love for the world cannot coexist with love for the Father. Therefore, if one claims to love God and yet loves the world, there is something wrong with his claim to love God. Christians have responded to the allure of the secular world in a variety of ways over the years. At one time, it was thought that if you were a really committed Christian and really wanted to love God instead of the world, you would leave human society and live as a monk or a nun out in a desolate monastery. There are two issues with this strategy, and with others like it, they try to remove us from the real world. The first problem is that we bring the world with us into our monastery. The other problem is that Jesus intended us to be in the world, but not of the world. This is evident in his prayer on our behalf. John chapter 17 verses 14 through 16 I have given to them your word the message you gave me and the world has hated them because they are not of the world and do not belong to the world just as I am not of the world and do not belong to it I do not ask you to take them out of the world but that you keep them and protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The character of the world expresses itself through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These lusts seek to draw our own flesh away into sin and worldliness. We read, He is not of the Father, but is of the world. This explains why the lust of the flesh 
The lust of the eyes and the pride of life are sin, even though they feel good and satisfy something in us. God knows we have a fleshly, bodily nature and physical needs that feel good when satisfied. Yet it is not in God's nature to influence us through the lust of the flesh. We usually believe that we think much more biblically than we really do. We should rigorously measure our habits of thinking and see if they follow more the world or God our Father. This shows how great our need is to not be conformed to this world. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 John chapter 2 verse 17 the world is passing away, and with it its lusts, the shameful pursuits and ungodly longings. But the one who does the will of God and carries out his purposes lives forever. This shows how absurd worldliness can be. Because this world is fleeting, anything we put our money into will inevitably perish along with it. The world despite appearances to the contrary, can never triumph over God, as we witnessed with the Tower of Babel. The world is passing away. This is powerfully illustrated by the life of Lot in Genesis chapters 13, 14, and 19. We read, He who does the will of God abides forever. This stands in strong contrast to the passing world, it makes much more sense to put our time and energy on something that will last forever, like carrying out God's purpose. We are in regular contact with three eternal things, the Holy Spirit of God, the people around you, and the eternal words recorded in the book you hold. Time, attention, and expense, but into those things pays eternal rewards. The spirit of the world drives to foolishness. God makes worldly wisdom, as promoted by the spirit of the world, foolish. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Jesus explained why we don't fit in. What does it mean that Christians are not of this world? The particular phrase, not of this world, appears in John chapter 18, verse 36, where Jesus says that his kingdom is not of this world. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world, nor does it have its origin in this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. As Christians, we are followers of Jesus Christ and members of his kingdom, which is not of this world. We know that our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians chapter 3 verses 17 through 20. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now will tell you even as I weep, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, 
and whose glory is in their shame, who have their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's kingdom is unlike any on this earth. So the church we attend has to be different from institutions of this world. While earthly kingdoms are grounded in this world, Christ's kingdom distinguishes itself by being spiritual in nature. Originating from heaven, it infuses life into the world. Although the Lord's kingdom is not of this world, it exercises authority over this world and has a significant impact on it. Jesus Christ and his disciples follow orders from above rather than from below. As believers, we are to focus our minds on heavenly things rather than earthly things. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of Christ's kingdom. This earth is not our permanent dwelling place. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes and of the boastful pride of life, pretentious confidence in one's resources, or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. The world is passing away, and with it its lusts, the shameful pursuits and ungodly longings. But the one who does the will of God and carries out his purposes lives forever. As believers, our primary loyalty lies with our ultimate authority, King Jesus and we belong to the heavenly citizenship. Like Jesus, we can also affirm that our kingdom is not of this world. This broken place is not our ultimate destination. We are receiving an unshakable kingdom. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 14 For here we have no lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude and offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We must attend a church that does not conform to the pattern of this world. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. As believers in Christ, we are called to live differently from the ways of the world around us. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul instructs us to avoid conforming to the world's pattern. He warns us not to allow ourselves to be molded or squeezed into its way of thinking and behaving. This same term is found in only one other place in the New Testament, which is, what is the meaning of the Christian teaching to not conform to the world according to Paul and Peter? Churches should not conform to the ways of the world. That is, we should not allow ourselves to be pressed into following the corrupt customs, ungodly principles, or evil plans of action promoted by worldly men. The blessed man, according to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, resists being conformed to the pattern of the world. Blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, following their advice and example, 
nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit down to rest in the seat of scoffers, ridiculers. Christians live in the world, but their way of life is not shaped by the worldly principles. They follow Jesus Christ and pattern their lives after Him rather than following the ways of the world that are said to be controlled by the devil, who is considered as the God of this world according to the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 For as a believer, you have been called for this purpose, since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow in his footsteps. According to the Bible, the term world does not refer to the physical world, but rather to the age or aeon. As per Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, Christians are rescued from this current wicked age, which is controlled by Satan and characterized by idolatry, carnal desires, and disobedience. Despite living in this world, believers rely on the powers of the age to come. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 5 And have tasted and consciously experienced the good word of God and the powers of the age, world to come. The Christian's mind can be transformed to break free from the world's conformity. Believers are able to obey God naturally and immediately because of the Holy Spirit's gift which works to transform their hearts and minds from within. Number four, stay away from churches that don't preach the cross. The cross lies at the center of the gospel. Jesus descended to earth with the specific intention of becoming a holy sacrifice for our transgressions. Although he did function as a teacher, friend and role model, his primary objective was to voluntarily submit himself to the cross, thereby satisfying the Father's wrath against all the wrongdoings of his creation. The cross of Christ can be seen as offensive to those who do not believe, and some churches may try to avoid discussing it in order to be more appealing to people. However, taking a softer approach may only provide temporary benefits and the true power of the gospel may be diluted. In order to withstand the challenges of life, we need the fullness of the gospel. Number five, stay away from churches that dismiss suffering or trials. If a church continually dismisses suffering or trials as being caused by a lack of faith, there is something wrong. Although the Bible mentions several times that a person's faith can heal them, physical healings and obvious solutions to problems do not always occur. The trials themselves and how we handle them are essential to our spiritual growth. Problems have a purpose that we may not see until we have gone through them and turned the corner. Number six, run away from churches that never convicts you of sin. At times, the Word of God may make us feel uncomfortable as we all fall short of where we should be. We may struggle with being unloving, stressed, and lazy. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan the prophet confronts King David about his sin. We all need someone like Nathan in our lives who can help us recognize and address the sins we may not see or are avoiding. When it's preached, the Word of God should point out the times when we've acted wrongly. Number seven, run away from a church that doesn't quote scripture. The complete collection of the Old and New Testament is fundamental to the church. It's not just about hearing stories and conventional sayings. It's important to quote actual scripture and read lengthy passages out loud. At times, we may need a paraphrase to better understand and apply the scripture, but in some cases, reading it directly from the Bible is sufficient. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16-17 through 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with open hearts and seeking minds, ready to dive into the depths of your word, the Bible. We thank you for the precious gift of Scripture, through which you reveal yourself to us and guide us on the path of righteousness. Lord, we acknowledge that understanding your word is not always easy. Sometimes we find ourselves lost in its pages, grappling with complex passages and unfamiliar concepts. But we trust in your promise that with diligence and faith, wisdom will be granted to those who seek it. Grant us, O Lord, the spirit of discernment as we study your word. Help us to approach it with humility, recognizing that our human understanding is limited, but your wisdom is boundless. May we not rely on our own intellect alone, but lean on your Holy Spirit to illuminate the truth hidden within the pages of Scripture. Father, we pray for clarity of mind as we engage with the Bible. May its teachings resonate deep within our souls, transforming our hearts and minds according to your will. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the profound truths embedded in each verse and the courage to apply them to our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have misinterpreted your word or twisted it to suit our own desires. Keep us from falling into the trap of cherry-picking verses to justify our actions and instead Grant us a holistic understanding of your message of love, grace, and redemption. As we delve into the depths of Scripture, may we never lose sight of its central message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to see Christ in every page, for he is the living word who became flesh and dwelt among us. May his example inspire us to walk in his footsteps, living lives of love, compassion, and selflessness. Lord, we lift up to you those who are struggling to understand your word. Whether they are new believers, lifelong seekers, or those facing doubts and questions, we ask for your guidance and enlightenment. Pour out your spirit upon them, opening their hearts and minds to receive the truth of your word in all its richness and depth. We also pray for those who are teaching and preaching your word. Grant them wisdom and discernment as they expound upon the scriptures, that they may faithfully convey your message with clarity and accuracy. May they be vessels of your truth, leading others into a deeper relationship with you. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of community. May we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, encouraging one another, sharpening one another, and bearing each other's burdens as we journey through the pages of Scripture together. In your mercy, O God, hear our prayer. Grant us the understanding, wisdom, and humility we need to fully grasp the riches of your word. May it dwell in us richly, shaping us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.